So we're thinking for just a few weeks, we're trying to think through what it means for us to do church, to do church. We, we know we are church. We know uh, being church is something that shapes our identity. It defines who we are. Uh, we know that we are God's redeemed people. That is who we are. But because that is who we are, that should shape what we do in various aspects and elements of life, not least when we come together as the church. You see, who we are shapes what we do. And so we've called this series Doing Church, and we wanted to just look at a few practical areas so that you and I are on the same page, so that you and I come on a Sunday or come midweek or think of Southern Cross with the same expectations, with the same anticipations, that we all know what we're looking forward to. Uh, last week, we had a look at what it means for us in terms of corporate worship. What does it mean when we gather on a Sunday? What are, what are we expecting on Sunday meetings? Uh, and this morning, I'm wanting to spend some time reflecting on what it means for us to be community. What does it mean for us to be community? Because my conviction is that Christian life is experienced in community. It's not lived in isolation. It's not meant to be lived in isolation. It's meant to be lived in the family of God. It's meant to be lived with one another, brothers and sisters. It's meant to be lived in community. And so that's what we're going to look at. And I promise I will eventually, I will eventually get to Ephesians chapter 4. Kerry didn't waste her time this morning. I will eventually get to Ephesians 4. But I actually want to start by, by just saying three foundational truths, three foundational observations about community that I'd like you to be wrestling with through the course of the morning and hopefully over lunch as well. Hey, here's the first thing I want you to get your head around, that the God you and I worship exists in community. Our God exists in community. See, for all eternity, the God Christians worship is the Trinity. The three in one, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So the God we worship exists in community. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit exist with each other, and they exist for each other. They exist for mutual glorification and for mutual enjoyment. I just think about the, our, our God for a moment. A community of perfect love, perfect harmony, perfect unity. Christina Fox writes, their relationship is one of self-giving love, each delighting in, adoring, honoring, and treasuring the others. So Tim Keller in one of his books concludes that ultimate reality, therefore, is a community of persons who know and love one another. For, for Tim, uh, ultimate reality is God himself. And so ultimate reality is a community of persons who know and love one another. Just for a moment, let that wash over you. I ponder the reality, a community of persons who know and love one another. Who know exhaustively. Who know completely. Nothing hidden. Nothing on the side. Everything displayed. True knowledge. And yet, despite that true knowledge, real love, genuine love. I wonder if you can imagine for a moment what it must be like to be in the presence of that in the heavenly realm. I mean, just for a moment, think what it must be like as, as we walk through the streets of heaven and we see this love for one another radiant throughout heaven. Imagine basking in the glory of this community, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, perfect knowledge, perfect love, perfect unity. And then as you think through that, uh, can I remind you that here is the incredible thing about the gospel. You see, this God who knows and loves one another, he deigned to share that with you and with me. Uh, the love that overwhelms the heavenly realm he says, I want you to be part of that. And that's why in Genesis chapter 1, we are told that when God made us, he made us in his image. Remember Genesis 1.26? Let us make mankind in our image and in our likeness. 
you and I share the likeness of God. Now, obviously, see, we don't share the likeness of God in every single way. But as we rule over creation, as we engage in relationship, so we reflect the God we worship. Uh, Genesis 1.27, male and female are both together bearing the image of God. And so we reflect God in our capacity for relationship, in our togetherness. In other words, it's not just that God exists in community, it's also that God creates you and me for community. That's the second thing. God creates us, humanity, for community. Uh, we know from the scriptures that God creates everything. We can go and read about it in Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2. And as he creates in those passages, passages, we're told that at every stage God saw that it was good. Uh, that's a way of saying it's exactly the way God intended it to be. It's as he meant it to be at every step of the way. In fact, chapter 1 concludes with this phrase, God saw all that he had made and it was very good good except when we get to chapter 2 we are told there is one thing that was not good chapter 2 verse 18 of Genesis says God said it was not good for man to be alone I will make a helper suitable for him it wasn't enough that Adam had access to God it wasn't enough that Adam had fellowship with God. Uh, just let that wash over you for a moment. Adam was in the presence of God. Adam had fellowship with God, and yet God says it is not good for Adam to be alone. Remember, Adam is an image bearer, and as an image bearer, he needed another human to properly reflect God's image. He needed someone else to be with him to properly fulfill God's purposes. And so God created Eve and thus formed community. Community. See, God's intention is for you and me, for us, to be in community too. We reflect God by being in community. We reflect God by forming relationships, by knowing and loving one another, by serving God together. Even that first com community, if we think back on it, it, it reflected God in so many ways. It was marked by harmony and peace. Harmony and peace not just between God and them, but between each other. They desired the best for each other. They found wholeness and joy in their community. Can you imagine that for a moment? If truth be told, most of us can't. We find it very hard to imagine a community that knows and loves each, each, each other in a perfect way. Uh, it's very hard to imagine an idyllic community when you and I live in a world that seems to be surrounded by heartache and conflict, by destruction. And so as we look at Genesis 1 and 2, we, we know that clearly something has gone wrong. Well, it's Genesis 3 that reminds us that Adam and Eve disobeyed God. And not only did they disobey God, they turned on each other. Sin entered our world, bringing doubt, bringing disobedience, bringing division, and ultimately, bringing death. Harmony is replaced with hostility. Desire for one another is replaced with destruction. Relationships are broken, and community is destroyed. Aren't you glad you came this morning? to be reminded of that. Because that's our world, isn't it? Our world is the world post-Genesis 3. And yet in the midst of Genesis 3, in the midst of it, God promises that he will send a Savior. He will not leave this as it is. He will send a Savior to gather a redeemed and a restored community of faith to himself. That's the third thing I want us to notice this morning that God redeems us to community. He redeems us to community. And he does that by himself in the person of his son, clothed in flesh and blood, who we call Jesus Christ, as he came to rescue 
and redeem. Do you remember what Jesus did? He came to gather the scattered sheep as the good shepherd. He came to seek and to save the lost who had drifted and gone away. He'd come to restore order. He'd come to make things right again. And to do that not just at an individual level, but to do that for community too. See, those who he redeems, every single one of them, become members of God's household. Uh, That's why we had the call to worship that we did today. Uh, Ephesians chapter 2 is one of the most glorious chapters uh, in terms of articulating the gospel and the restoration that Jesus brings, the reconciliation that Jesus brings. It's the most powerful chapter. If you've forgotten it, read it over lunchtime again with your family today. But the conclusion at the end of that chapter, as he's spoken about those who are redeemed, those who are saved, those who've been justified, those who've been made right with God, here's his conclusion, that now they are part of the family of God. You know, when babies are born, it's why I showed you that video clip. When babies are born, they don't, out they come and we leave them to their own devices. We know that that's not what happens. That's not what happens to family, we know that. Okay, I'm going to need at least one blind open if, if you want me to see my notes. And even then, that might not help. Let me. There's no, no pressure like the whole church watching you as you lift the blinds up. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, guys. You know, we showed that video clip because I, I want us to remind us that we, we understand birth. Birth is into a family. You belong just because you're born. But actually, the same picture is true when we are born again. We are born into a family. We become the family of God. He is our Father. We are His children. You and I are our brothers and sisters. See, those whom God redeems become members of His household. He redeems us into community. That's what He does. So Dietrich Bonhoeffer writes, we have community with each other because of what Christ has done to each of us and to all of us. Our identity as Christians is worked out in community, the church. You and I are not primarily united by location. We're not primarily united by common stage of life. Are we not united by shared experience? No, the thing that unites us fundamentally is a shared Savior. We are redeemed into the same community. And just think about that for a moment. That means you and I are united by Jesus to believe as past and present and future. We are united to saints already in heaven and those yet to be born. We are united to saints in other parts of the world and those just down the road. Christ redeems us, but he redeems us into the community of faith, into the family of God. Three things I want you to get your head around this morning. God exists in community. God made us for community and God redeems us to community. Now with that, with that floating around your head, with that in the melting pot, come with me now to Ephesians chapter 4. Uh, we won't have a, a, like, don't worry, I'm not starting the sermon now. Okay? Just come with me to Ephesians 4. And I, I want you just to think through this now. Because as we read each, Ephesians 4 in light of what I've said, here's a few things that we can conclude. Two important things. The first one is that community is intrinsic to our belief. It's intrinsic to our belief. We can't say to ourselves, I'm going to become a Christian, I'm going to believe the gospel, I'm going to believe and have faith, and then go and pretend to be a lone ranger. Then go to wander off on my own, to think like Paul Simon, I'm an island, I'm a rock, I have no need for no one. What garbage, that is not the theme for Christians at all. Community is fundamental to our identity. And so to shrug, to shrug at the idea of community, to shrug at your commitment to community, is actually to shrug at the idea of faith. That's why I have a look at Ephesians chapter 4. Did you notice how in verses 4 through 6? Seven times 
Seven times Paul uses that little word one. And do you know why? Because he wants to show us the united nature of this community of faith. He wants to show us that this isn't two or three or four at the risk of stating the obvious. No, this is one community. We are one body formed by one spirit. We share in the same faith, one faith. Why? Because we serve the same Lord who redeemed us and rescued us from bondage. We are bound by the same baptism. That's the death of Christ, actually. By one baptism into the death of of Jesus Christ. And you and I cling to exactly the same hope. Your hope should be no different to my hope. And my hope should be no different to your hope. We cling to one hope, the future glory, when Jesus returns. That's why he finishes that little phrase. And it's no surprise really that our faith brings us into the family where we all have the same father. The same father. The father who is over all and through all and in all. See, here's the thing. When our faith is in the God of the Bible, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, it binds us to the community of faith. That is his family. We are in this together whether you want it or not whether you like it or not that's what it means to be Christian to be Christian means to be in the family of God Jerry Bridges in his book True Community writes the first Christians of Acts chapter 2 were not devoting themselves to social activities but to a relationship A relationship that consisted of sharing together the very life of God through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. They understood they had entered this relationship by faith in Jesus, not by joining an organization. They realized that their fellowship with God logically brought them into fellowship with one another. Through their union with Christ, they were formed into a spiritual, organic community. And so they devoted themselves to the fellowship, to the fellowship. Fellowship, properly understood, is not just grabbing a cup of tea and a quick biscuit at the end of the service. It can't be that. Now, now surely fellowship has to be much richer than that, much more than that. Our fellowship, properly understood, is to, to enjoy shared life with other members of the body, to welcome brothers and sisters into the family. Our fellowship, dear friend, is not, it's not rooted in common experience or, or shared interest. Can I suggest you it's not even defined by affectionate feelings and by friendship. It's about sharing a common life together because of Christ. You know, it might be that you are trying to become friends with me. That was a joke, (laughs) apparently not a good one. (laughs) See, I'm the new guy, I've just arrived, new minister. Maybe you're trying to be friends with me. And and don't misunderstand, I'd love to be your friend. But can I share the news? We don't need to be friends because we're family. You're stuck with me and I'm stuck with you. I think about it when when you're thinking about it. You you know, you, you live in Cape Town, you've got your three friends, you know. And you can only have more friends when a vacancy comes up. You let people know. All right? that's, what we, that's how we treat people in Cape Town. I've got my three friends. I do everything with my three friends. I go to the mountain with my three friends. I go to the pub with my three friends. I go to the movie with my three friends. When one of them dies, you may apply to become the third friend if you would like to. That's how we work in Cape Town. I, I understand that. So we're very protective over our friendship. But here's the thing. Your brother arrives and says to you, good news, not only have I got married, my wife's pregnant, and we're having a child. You don't turn around and say at that moment, but the three positions are full. There's a difference in your thinking between how you treat friends and applications for friends and how you treat family. As the family grows, you welcome them. You accept them. You include them. You buy them birthday presents. You invite them for Christmas. You you do life with them. Why? Because they are your family. I know some of you are thinking at this moment, Darn it. The nice thing is you can choose your friends. You can't choose your family. I get that. But we are family friends. That is what we are. If you are a Christian and I am a Christian, we are family. 
We're family. We're bound by blood, by the blood of Jesus Christ. And so the challenge for us is to be that community, to do that community. See, we were created for community. We were designed to reflect the community of our God. We were redeemed for community. And now we must be that community within our church family. Now we must commit to share life together because we are family, flesh and blood, commitment, face-to-face interactions. And so I want to encourage you today. Can you, can you think about how you can share life with your family at Southern Cross? Can you think practical ways that you might do that? Can, can you think a very simple one? I know what it's like. I, I know, okay, for some of you it's Thursday night, but I know what it's like. Wednesday evening, five o'clock comes and the thing you can dr- not even begin to think about is going to community group tonight. I mean, let's be honest. Three days into the week, you're exhausted. Uh, uh, Thursday night, ish, that's four days into the week. You know how tired I am by Thursday night. So the last thing you feel like doing is to go and be community. But dear friends, fight that. Fight that. Resist that. I know what it was like this morning when you got up and you opened up the curtains and you saw this glorious, glorious day and you thought, this is beach weather. This is picnic weather. Friends, fight those feelings. Plan your week. Plan your energy levels. Plan your diary. Do what you need to do to be with your family, to be community. Whether that's your community group midweek, whether it's your corporate worship group on Sunday. Because here's the thing, this is where you belong. You talk to so many young people today, what are they doing? They're looking for a sense of belonging. They're desperate for a sense of belonging. We've got the answer, actually. We know where you belong. You belong here. Certainly if you're a Christian, you belong here. This is home. This is where you're meant to be. This should be the place where we find connection and care. This is the place we should find authentic community. This is where you should feel you can always come. It's got to be our safe place. And can I say, the rest of us have to be working to that end. Well, we've got to make sure this is the place where, where we're always glad they came. Do you remember, I, I know you look at me and you see me very young, but I'm, I'm old enough that I remember Cheers. Do some of you remember Cheers? Put your hand up. I won't make you stand up. Put your hand up if you know Cheers. Okay. We've all shown our age now. Uh, Cheers was the pub. Do you remember the theme song? Everybody knows your name and they're always glad you came. That was a description of the pub. The pub. That should be the description of the church. Everybody knows your name and they're always glad you came. Our hearts should light up when we see them walking through that door, even even at 9.35. (laughs) Our hearts should light up, because here's the thing. Here's the thing. They've resisted their temptation to go elsewhere. They've resisted their temptation to sleep in. They've resisted the temptation to be distracted. And you know what they've done? They've come home. I've come to be community with us. And we should delight in that. We should rejoice in that. We should celebrate that. We should reach out because here's the thing. As you look through the room today, do you know everybody's name? Just have a quick scan. Have a quick scan through the room. I discovered at the door this morning, I've been calling somebody the wrong name for the last four weeks. That's why they kept on ignoring me. I've discovered now why. (laughs) See, but look through the room. Do you know everybody's name? See, what kind of a community are we going to be? Southern Cross has to decide that. What kind of community will we be? Because community is intrinsic to our faith. It's intrinsic to who we claim to be as a local church. But more than that, it's not just intrinsic to our belief. Can I say to you, lastly, that community is ensured by your behavior and by my behavior. It's ensured by our behavior. Now just think about community for a moment. I'm suggesting it's about us getting real together about us growing together in truth and in love, about helping each other through the tough times and the trials, about lifting each other up when we fall and when we are frail. It's about praying for one another, urging one another on, and ultimately, it's about reflecting Christ's love for one another. But I'm not naive. I know the moment that that is my expectation, I know that that is going to be jolly hard. 
And I know that that is going to be messy. <laughs> I know it's going to be messy. Let's be honest, relationships are messy. Relationships are hard work in the best of circumstances. If you have not worked this out about the new minister, let me tell you, I'm different to you. I'm opinionated. I'm selfish. I'm stubborn. I'm sinful. The problem is my wife is nodding at all of those. <laughs> see, see, here's the problem with relationships. We're, we're a bunch of sinners together, aren't we? Redeemed sinners, forgiven sinners, sinners by grace. But here, I, I still want my own way. And that's why Paul reminds us. He reminds us that while Jesus brings us together into community, while Jesus makes the unity, it's you and me who keep the unity. Did you see that verse 3? Make every effort. You. You make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Oh, Jesus has brought us together. The Spirit binds us together. But we've got to put that into practice. We've got to make sure that we are diligent. Diligent not to be divisive. Diligent not to be disruptive unnecessarily. We've got to be people who intentionally protect one another and care for one another and love one another, fighting for our unity. We've got to lay our selfishness aside. We've got to work on what's good for all of us, for the whole group. See, if we are prisoners to Christ, that's verse 1, if we're bound to Jesus, then we must behave in a certain way. We protect the family, we protect the community. I take it that's what he means when he says in verse 1, live in a manner worthy of your calling. Your calling as a citizen of the kingdom. Your calling as a child in the family of God. And Paul is very clear about what that looks like. And, and, and I'm so grateful to Chip that it, it's flown throughout our service today in terms of when we prayed and when we looked at the start. Did you see what he says? Be humble. Be humble. Don't consider yourself more highly than you ought. Fight against the pride in your own hearts. Renounce self-centeredness. Renounce the pursuit of self-glory. Be humble. Be gentle. Be mindful of others. Help them bear their burdens. Renounce harshness. Throw away unreasonableness. Be considerate of others. And do that without pressure on them without manipulating them. Oh, I, I wish he didn't say this one. Be patient. Oh, be patient. Be long-suffering with each other. Remember, God has been incredibly long-suffering with you, and now he calls you to be long-suffering with each other. Make allowances for each other's shortcomings. Make allowances for each other's struggles, knowing we're, we're all at different stages of the journey. We're all in different places. Renounce the tyranny of our own agenda. Patient. Bear with one another in love. Love each other well. Love each other well. Overcome each other's weaknesses and failings together. It's not about you and your rights and your status and what's best for you. Now sacrificially give of yourself to each other. See, Paul says if, we, if we're going to keep the unity of the faith, if we're going to make community work, it will mean we'll have to be deliberately humble and gentle and patient and loving. Now, that, that's not to say for a minute. It's not to say that we fudge the truth. It's not to say that we don't have hard conversations. It's not to say that we turn a blind eye to sin. We don't do that. Of course not. But when we have those types of conversations, we do so in a way that's loving and gentle and patient and humble. Uh, we have those conversations in a way that promotes unity and community rather than seeks to divide and conquer. And you and I, we all know that because we know life. We know that there are so often times that if the person had just said it to you slightly differently, you'd still be with them. You would have stuck around being wise in how we speak to each other. See, can I say to you, how you treat one another, how I treat you and how you treat me matters. How we treat those amongst our family who are different to us matters. How we treat those who might even disagree with us on secondary issues matters. Matters. 
And so our behavior, our behavior either ensures community or it ends it. It builds it or it breaks it. And so Southern Cross is going to have to decide which will they choose. Will they choose to build community or to break community? You will have to decide, will you build community or will you break it? See, my challenge to you this morning, in light of everything we've said from Genesis 1 and 2, and everything we've said from Ephesians 4, is will you pursue community? Will you prize it? Will you prize it? Will you, will you see fellowship as something special? Will you be intentional and deliberate about it? Will you, will you reach out? I think one of the strengths of Southern Cross is you know each other well and you're a community. You've gone through hardship and you've gone through difficulty and that's brought you together and that's great. The challenge is, will you now be a community that welcomes others into the community? Will you grow the community? Will you let others break in? Will you let others become part of the family? Will we grow together and build a community of faith here? Many people have been doing studies. Do you remember the church of Sardis in your studies? Will we, will we build a reputation for a church that is humble and gentle and patient and loving? A place, a place where the community of faith matters. You and I are made for community. We're redeemed for community. And so let's be that community marked by faith and by family and by fellowship.